you would turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are at somewhat of erratic uh, pace going through the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, but we're at 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 5. So many great verses in this uh, book, it would take a long time to deal with them. But tonight we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now the context of 1 Corinthians is that Paul started the church at Corinth on his, first mission, on his second missionary journey. On his third missionary journey, he is at Ephesus. And while he is at Ephesus, there are those who came from the church at Corinth, and uh, we read about them in 1 Corinthians 16, 17, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. And uh, they came to Ephesus, and uh, uh, they had some questions um, for the Apostle Paul about a number of issues, but they also had a report. They had a report about certain problems in the church. And uh, as we get to uh, <clears throat> chapter 5, um, we uh, uh, get to one of the problems. Uh, the problems are many times introduced by the phrase, it is commonly reported. And the questions are introduced by the word now. And so, um, if you go through the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll find, find a lot of nows. Um, and they are an answer to questions that the people had. Uh, for instance, in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 7, they had a question about uh, marriage. And so the chapter starts off with now. Now concerning the, the things wherever he wrote unto me. Chapter 8, they had a question about things offered to idols. And so chapter 8 starts off with the phrase, now, as touching things offered to idols. Um, chapter 5 starts off with the phrase, it is reported. It is reported. And now we're dealing with problems in the church. And they needed to know Paul um, now is going to give them uh, God's uh, truth about these certain problems and what to do about them. And so, as we um, come to this chapter, we are dealing with the problem of um, unrepentant, heinous public sin. Unrepentant, heinous public sin. And uh, he talks about these kinds of sins in verse 11. But I have now, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such, in other words, this isn't the, this isn't the whole list. This is um, uh, public heinous sin, unrepented public heinous sin. And so, um, with such, and one, no, not to eat. And so, um, <clears throat> we are dealing with that uh, uh, subject uh, that they had, they problem they had, unrepentant, heinous, public sin. And so, we're going to um, uh, uh, share with you four um, <clears throat> truths, four statements of the Apostle Paul concerning uh, such things. And the first thing the Apostle Paul um, makes clear 
is that public, unrepentant, heinous sin <coughs> mars the testimony of God. Mars the testimony of God. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles. And in this particular case, that one should have his father's wife. Apparently, um, a son, um, uh, we would expect maybe his father died, but uh, he marries um, not his, his mother, uh, but um, perhaps the second wife of his father. And uh, very clearly defined in the Bible as in, uh, incestuous um, a situation. And he uh, makes a, a very um, significant statement. Is reported, there's fornication among you. Now, <clears throat> fornication in the Bible is a big word. Fornication in the Bible is a big word. Um, Fornication refers to all kinds of immorality. It is used of, uh, of unnatural immorality. Um, it is used of, of uh, incestuous immorality, like it is here. Um, it is also um, specifically in the Bible used of premarital immorality. And the context will tell you uh, what, uh, uh, what definition of this word is being uh, 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 needed in that particular case. In this case, the word fornication refers to incestuous immorality. And um, he says uh, that this was um, a sin that is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Here's a man who claims to be a brother, and we find out that he was saved. Second Corinthians, we find that he did repent. And, uh, but uh, he was in a very um, wicked relationship. And this wicked relationship uh, was a terrible testimony for the name of Jesus Christ. A terrible testimony for the name of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we sin, we just think about ourselves. That's the main characteristic of sin. Sin is all about ourselves. And when we sin, we don't think about God, and we don't think about his testimony, and we don't think about a lot of things. But uh, um, these kinds of sins that the Bible mentions here, um, it says in verse 11, fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railing, drunkenness, extortioners. Um, the Bible says these are all are sins that mar the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that uh, um, they cause others to uh, question the reality of God. They cause others to question the reality of uh, the message of the gospel. Um, it gives Satan an opportunity for people to mock the things of God. So, um, this public unrepentant sin um, was marring the testimony of God. Now, there's a second truth, though, about this kind of sin. Is that this sin, as well, makes the worship of God in the church a mockery. It makes the worship of God in the church a mockery. If you turn with me to verse um, 
7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now he's talking about the Lord's Supper. And he's talking about the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, the bread represents the sinless body of Christ. In the Lord's Supper, the grape juice represents the sinless, holy blood of Jesus. They are a picture of Christ who is our Passover, who died in our place. It is a very um, important time of worship in the house of God. It's commanded by God. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. Those who neglect the Lord's Supper are in disobedience to God, those church members. It's not to be taken lightly. But the Lord's Supper um, has a very serious um, spiritual uh, message. Maybe you would say, in the local church, it's the deepest point of worship of God. And what is he saying? He's saying, unless you remove this man who is unrepentant of his sin, unless you remove him from your membership, now, not, it's, uh, not, the church cannot... Uh, take someone's salvation away. But unless you remove this person from the membership, this unrepentant, he says, you're going to mar and make a mockery of the worship of God. And you're going to allow this man who is in sin, unrepentant sin, a heinous sin, to worship the Lord with you. Worship the Lord with you. He says, um, let's keep the feast with not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. That Lord's Supper is a picture of communion with the Holy God. And to say that we in our church or any church could have, uh, uh, we could worship God in sin. is to make the worship of God a sham. That's serious. That is serious. Now there's a third truth about uh, this. It says to not deal with this unrepentant public sin is thirdly, to leaven the church of God. Is to leaven the church of God. It says, in verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that for purpose that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
And of course, it makes it very clear that any time a church deals with public sin or sin, it has one purpose for the rescue and the restoration of that person. In this case, it was an unrepentant person. And so, um, for that unrepentant person to come to repentance, the Bible said you have to deliver him to Satan and take him out of the protection of the umbrella of the church. Verse 6, though, he says, your glory is not good. The church at Corinth was proud. They were proud of their tolerance. They were proud of their tolerance. They were proud of the attitude that we can handle this. It's not going to affect us. This is a, maybe he was an important person in the church. And, uh, and so uh, they said, no, um, um, they were glorying. You know, a lot of people glory in, in something like this. They say, you know, um, um, I can handle this. They're unrepentant. They're set in their ways. But, you know, I can handle this. I, I'm better than the rest of the people. I'm going to invite them over, and we're going to go golfing together, and uh, we're going out for a fish fry together, and, and uh, uh, we're just going to, um, you know, I'm his buddy. I'm his buddy. I'm better than the people in church. I don't have to obey God. I'm better. I'm more spiritual. He says, your glory isn't good. And then he says, knowing not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, the Bible tells us that unrepentant, heinous sin, allowed in the church, leavens the church. You know, what does that look like? What does that look like? I'd have to say I thought I knew. But I think that I know more about this than I ever did. What does that look like? Well, we know that leaven is an invisible, insidious, permeating spiritual influence that leavens everyone within its touch, just like yeast in the bread, in the dough. Invisible, insidious, permeating, spiritual, wicked, negative spiritual influence. Now, what happens when a church is experiencing leaven? There's a free flow of sin. A free flow of sin. You know, as a pastor, you preach the Bible, you pray, you preach, and um, you see people get right with God. But when leaven is in the church, you preach, you pray, people don't get right with God.
and people go into sin and it spreads. And there's no stopping it. There's no stopping it. A helpless, helpless feeling. When you see sin spreading throughout the congregation. One after another. Boom, 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 boom. It's leaven. It's leaven. It's an amazingly terrible thing. Unrepentant sin in the church. Leavens the church. You know the just man falleth and he getteth up. But when leaven is working, the just man falleth and he stays down. And others and others and others and others and others follow suit. The fear of God is lost. In this passage of scripture we find, fourthly, that public unrepentant heinous sin, God demands the purifying action of the church. God demands the purifying action of the church. Now notice it says, verse 11, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a brother. Now so it's talking about people who profess to be saved. Be a fornicator, covetous, an idolater, a railer, or drunkard, or extortioner, with such an one not to eat. Now, maybe I should insert something. That we ought to do everything we can to bring a person to repentance. And when they come to repentance, we should do everything we can. Everything we can to help them go forward. You know, only carnal people throw sticks and rocks at people who've repented and are trying to get up. Spiritual people forgive and they pray and they love. Big difference. But notice, he says, I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that's called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, or drunkard, or extortioner, with such an one not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are out, without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from you among yourselves that wicked person. You see, God demands the purifying action of the church. He says the church has a duty to judge, to judge sin, to call it sin, to name it sin, to stand on God's side and say no. This is sin. You know, isn't it amazing when you read the Bible? Christianity is so mixed up today. You know, one of the favorite sayings of the emo crowd is, 
You know what the favorite saying, saying an emo crowd is? Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But you know what the Bible says? It says when it comes to public, heinous sin that brings reproach to the, Christ, to the name of Christ, we ought to judge it. We ought to judge it. And so with that, there was um, a number of different issues. Number one, they're not to keep company with such a one. They're not to keep company with such a one. They're not to keep company with such a one. I mean, do we have to use the English word more than once? <laughs> don't keep company with such a one. You don't fellowship with them as though there's nothing wrong. Actually, the word fellowship, in that case, you are, you are distorting the word fellowship. Because the word fellowship means to stand on the same ground as God. That means you have a pretty distorted view of God. Secondly, it said, verse 5, it says, When you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word here, power, I would um, uh, imagine it's not the word uh, dunamis. It's probably the word um, exuthia, authority. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The implication is this. As long as that person is in the church in good standing, they're under the protection of the church. And Satan is hindered from dealing with them. On the other hand, Leaven, the sin, leaven of this, the leaven of sin will be free to spread within the church. But when that sin is judged and the umbrella of protection of church membership is taken away, the Bible says now um, Satan will be free to deal with that person for one reason. Will God allow it? That is to bring them to repentance. <clears throat> Just a sidelight here. I think that uh, here um, we have a very, very interesting um, uh, uh, insight into the whole principle of authority and the whole principle of the umbrella of protection of authority. And I will say, most Christians don't understand that principle. Most Christians don't understand that principle of authority. But we see clearly that as long as this person is under that protection of that umbrella, he is protected against what God wants to do in their life through Satan. But on the other hand, the church that is disobedient to God will be permeated with sin. Permeated with sin. And it will spread. The fear of God will be gone. Just one after another, one after another will go wayward. Just as though it was a free-flowing river. And so these are some serious instructions from the Apostle Paul. Unrepentant. May we underline that. Actually, here, I think we understand that uh, um, 
this process is, is, does not refer to a person who is repentant. It refers to an unrepentant, heinous public sin. It mars the testimony of God. It makes the worship of God a mockery. It leaves the church open to the insidious permeation of the leavening influence of sin. It demands the purifying action of the church. And perhaps we could say for its own survival. For its own survival. Sobering truths. Sober, sobering truths. You know, I don't get much, many places. Um, I don't uh, go places uh, that are not like ours, so I don't know. But I've been told, I've been told that across America that very, very few churches ever practice church discipline. If that is so, no wonder there's so little fear of God. No wonder that worldliness and sin permeate so many churches. No wonder in so many places that even if the pastor is preaching, it doesn't do a lick of good. You know, these are um, serious truths. I think normal church life should be in such that the fear of the Lord is there. I think normal church life is that making decisions for God, getting rid of sin, doing right is normal. Normal. And that coming to church and feeling the power, sensing the power of the Word of God and the presence of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is normal. Normal. And it's normal. For God's people to repent and get right. It's normal. You know, as a pastor under normality, Your goal is to see everybody right with God. Because when everybody's right with God, you have spiritual power. And people come in and get saved. They get genuinely converted. And the Spirit of God does a marvelous work in their life. Even without preaching, they get rid of bad music. Even without preaching, they stop watching bad movies. Even without preaching, they, they hunger for the Word of God. Even without preaching, they're sensitive to the Spirit of God. That's normal. 
And obviously the pastor's job, though, um, is that he knows the, the sheep with all the problems. And, you know, one sheep gets up and does right. Another sheep falls down, needs to get right. So always working on helping the sheep get up and do right, repent and get right. So that there might be the time when everybody is right with God. But you know what? In cases such as this are happening, instead of that process of constantly people getting up and getting right with God, you have more and more and more and more people not right with God and away from God in love with the world hardened hearts unresponsive to God's word worldly proud one after another I'm wondering have you gotten to a place where becoming more worldly more critical more tolerant to sin. Do you come to that place in your life? And do you see the friends that are around you in the same place? And it doesn't bother you? It doesn't scare you to death? That's a sad place to be. It's a place where there is no fear of God. And where that takes place, there's no end to the downfall. May God deliver us. Let's pray. Lord, these are sobering truths. They are as true as true can be, for your word is true in every wit, in every way. There is an enemy, the devil. We have a, we are living in an evil world and in even an evil age. And we have a deceitful, powerless, ungodly, sinful heart called the flesh. And Lord, we rejoice. that you have won the victory over all. The victory over sin, which we'll ne we could never defeat, only in your strength, which will always defeat us. And Satan, 
his world. Lord, <coughs> you risen from the dead. Lord, all we long that we'd be a people of victory. Oh God, we long we'd be a people of victory. Lord, Bring us back to the place of the fear of God. Deliver us, Lord, from that time, that, that situation where the people of God seem to be overcome by the leavening influence of sin. Lord, revive us again. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Only you can do it. Lord, you said you resist the proud, but give grace unto the humble. We need you, Lord. Pray that even tonight, that, Lord, we would be serious about our own sin. We'd not take it lightly. I pray that you'd help us be serious about sin in itself. I pray you'd help us to realize that sin is a leavening influence. It destroys and defeats and maims everyone it comes in contact with. Oh, God, might you work in our midst. Might we love you. Might we serve you. Might we obey you. Might your spirit be free to, in our life that we could live a holy life before you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, Take a moment and think about what God might be saying to you. And so now, Lord, we thank you that you are the great God of heaven. We pray you'd show yourself great, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.